Al, it seems like a cliche, but it really feels like yesterday that you and I were sitting here before the first conference a year ago to initiate the big questions in Free Will Project. And now we've had a year of, of research. Uh, we just heard some papers. I love to hear what your perspectives are. You talked about three wings, neuroscience, uh, philosophical foundations, theology, uh, neuroscience. We heard a lot of that today. Uh, how's it going? Oh, I think it's going well. Um, a lot of progress has been made even in just the last year. And to set it up for you, I need to talk about a study done in the early 80s that got the ball rolling. This was the ball in neuroscience rolling toward no free will for anyone. <laughs> right. So that's what we're talking about. The work was done by Benjamin Libet. And what he thought he showed is that the brain makes decisions to do things about a third of a second before the mind becomes aware of it. And he thought if free will is involved in a process, then consciousness has to be initiating the process and, and the action. So if you're conscious of your decisions only after you make them, <laughs> consciousness isn't initiating the process and isn't involved really in the production of the action. In Libet's case, it was simple actions like mm -hmm. uh, flexing the wrist. So That's a radical um, conclusion, if true. It's a radical conclusion, if true, definitely. In a 2009 book of mine, I suggested that based on the data we had at that time, I wrote the book in 2008, it takes time for a book to appear, <laughs> more than a few milliseconds, <laughs> yeah. uh, I suggested that the data didn't support the idea that the decision was made unconsciously um, and that the person became aware of it later. And now we're getting uh, new data that is going my way, and I'm, I'm happy to see it too. Um, so one talk we heard today was by Uri Maus, who's a, a neuroscientist, and he has access to epilepsy patients. And those patients have open skulls for diagnostic purposes. And if they agree to be subjects in his little experiments, which are kind of fun for the patients, um, they can. Um, and I won't. We were with him in the surgery and for one of the patients and saw that, so we're very familiar with the story, so I'm fascinated to know how the data has turned out. Okay, terrific, yeah. And uh, he has evidence, actually, that the decisions are made at the time at which people are aware of the decision. So later than Libet said, and closer to the time of action. Again, Libet thought the decisions were made about a third of a second before the time of action. Uri has evidence that they're made um, when people think they're made. And so what you're going to have is a causal process, parts of which are unconscious, parts of which are conscious, actually, because the patients know what the task is. Sure. It's to try to trick the experimenter. So the patient will press this button or that button and try to fool the experimenter into thinking he's not going to press the button he presses or she. Hmm. Uh, so they know what the task is and they have a conscious strategy, or a conscious goal anyway, trick the guy, uh, and uh, you know they'll try to do it because they win money. They win a dime, actually, yeah. if they trick him. Um, and so all this brain processing is going on, and some is associated with these conscious goals and the like, and some probably isn't, most definitely isn't. And um, Uri's most reliable predictions happen at a certain point in time, and it turns out that point coincides with the point the patients say they first became aware of their intention to do it. And is that because he has better resolution, because he's recording from the actual brain rather than for, through the, the skull and the dura mater and everything else? Yeah, for sure. He has much better resolution. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a cleverly designed experiment. Now, um, and, and I think that's terrific. Peter C. has uh, is another neuroscience uh, person we funded. And he has uh, similar evidence, but it's, uh, it's a much more complicated setup. Um, Peter actually said, I guess it was yesterday, that um, neuroscience of free will took a wrong turn in the early 1980s mm -hmm. in studying the, the Libet stuff, and they should have gone in other directions. But again, these are talks I just heard this <laughs> weekend. I need to look uh, at the experimental sure. design, absorb the evidence. Um, Patrick Haggard is another neuroscientist of ours. That is, uh, he has one of our grants. And Patrick now is getting um, much better at predicting what people will do on the basis of EEG. So now his prediction rate 
uh, in certain studies is about 85%. So about 85% of the time he's right. And what he'll ask people to do is to, you know, make a choice like press this button or that button. Um, make it, but don't execute it until they get a go signal and then they execute it. And they're supposed to stick with whatever they chose in one, one version of his experiment. And so you're taking readings and you're taking readings all the way up to the, the point where they say they've made a choice. And then you make a prediction on the basis of those readings. Will you press this one or that one? Right. Patrick's getting close to 100. He's getting to 85%. But he still has his uh, predictivity prior to the moment of consciousness. He suggested that's his claim. But that was that was his claim. Now, he didn't actually talk about that here. Um, I guess he gave his talk on Friday. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what he thinks about that now. He might still think the same thing. Um, actually... This is a little bit complicated, and it sort of takes a step away from the experiments, but suppose that there was a little lag between the time when the decision was made and the time when you became aware that you made it. And I can give you an example. In fact, I can give you an example using my program, because one thing I had to do as part of my job as director of the Big Questions and Free Will Project is make the program. So I knew we were going to have nine speakers, uh, we had five neuroscience teams, uh, three social psychology teams, a developmental psychologist, which is a new project, and then three philosophers. Mm -hmm. And my goal was to have a kind of integrated mix of things instead of a block of all neuroscientists, a block mm -hmm. of social psychologists, and so on. And then I had to get information about where they were coming from, <laughs> yeah. who might or would arrive late, right. who had to right. leave early. Right. And all this stuff is going on. And then I had to make particular decisions, like who would go first on Friday and who would go second. So let me see. If I look, maybe I can remember how I made my decision even. Um, okay, Saturday morning, 9 o'clock. And I'm thinking, well, we've got five neuroscience teams, so that's the majority of teams. It's probably good to have neuroscientists go earlier so we can spread them out. Uh, Patrick, I already had talk on Friday. Uh, we had a group coming from Israel. I figured they would be jet lagged. Um, and so, oh, and Peter C., who gave the talk, is a very conscientious guy. I knew he wouldn't mind <laughs> giving a talk at right. nine o'clock, and he'd be well prepared and well rested. A lot of elements went into your decision. Tons. And so, and I finally said to myself, as it were, okay, Peter, you know, and I, I plugged him right. in. Now, suppose I made that decision 200 milliseconds before I became aware of it. The point is that still a lot of conscious processing went into making that decision. Mm -hmm. And I think free will isn't so tied to the moment at which you're first aware that a decision has been made. I think it's more closely tied to conscious processing and what it leads to. Mm -hmm. And my hunch is that I selected Peter for basically the reasons I thought I did. You know, I wasn't deluded about mm -hmm. it even if I'm just a bit off in my detection of my decision, my conscious detection of it. And, you know, we're a bit off in perception of the world and so on. We lag behind. There could be a little lag internally. So even if it had turned out that Libet was right and we made our decisions a third of a second before we thought we did, if we were making those decisions for the reasons we thought we were making them, um, maybe there's no problem at all. There's actually another dimension to this, too. So some people now, including some of our uh, neuroscience teams, like to put it in terms of a disti distinction between picking and choosing. Mm -hmm. So in Lippitt's study, what you're doing is picking a moment to begin flexing at. And so you, let's say you pick moment 19. <laughs> well, there's no real difference between right. moment 18 and 19 or 19 and 20. It's just arbitrary. It's like uh, going to the supermarket and you have a list of things to get, and one of them is a 16-ounce box of Morton Salt. Mm -hmm. You go to the Mar Morton Salt display and you just pick one. You don't think about what's better. Um, so that's picking, and maybe free will isn't involved much in picking because nothing hangs on it. Um, and choosing might be something different. It's uh, making a decision for reasons. So when you have competing reasons to do this or that, and you settle it by choosing. Now, I think that's what I did in the case of selecting Peter C. to speak in the 9 o'clock spot on Saturday morning. 
And I had these different factors in mind. It was kind of complicated. A lot of conscious thinking was involved in information gathering. Uh, and that led to this decision. If you had asked me exactly when I made it, I might be a bit <laughs> off, but I really don't see how it matters. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're thinking that Libet made a wrong turn, that would be one reason to think that he did, that he's not really picking out something really important for free will. <laughs> Even if what you say is 100% true in terms of the richness and complexity of free will, mm -hmm. it's still both scientifically and maybe fundamentally interesting to know whether the decision is made a third of a second before my conscious awareness or at the moment of conscious awareness. Well, you know, I'm a very curious guy, and I'm curious about that, too, <laughs> but I don't know how important it is. You can picture it this way. You get this EEG ramp up, goes like that, comes up like this, and maybe somewhere along there a decision is made. And the question is, you know, where is it made? And then also, where along that curve does the first person uh, first become conscious of the right, decision? Right. Now, suppose the way the brain works is you do a, a lot of conscious processing. In the case of choosing, not picking, because mm -hmm. there's nothing to think about, mm -hmm. a lot of conscious processing, mm -hmm. and that raises the probability higher and higher mm -hmm. that you're going to make a certain decision. Mm -hmm. And you might even feel, like maybe I felt, oh, I'm really close to deciding but on Peter, but I haven't quite yeah, done it. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, now I've done it. Yeah. And maybe when I felt I was really close, I had already made it. Yeah. Um, That's you know, interesting. Maybe. But yeah. it doesn't seem like that much of a big okay. deal. Okay. All right. What do you expect for the next year? What, what, what are your hopes and, and dreams to see what can really be accomplished in the neuroscience of free will? What, what, what would you like to see? And what would you be disappointed if you didn't see? Oh, I see. Well, I, I think it would be nice uh, to get better accuracy at um, predicting people's motions, you know, on the basis of brain readings of different kinds. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing more evidence that uh, we make our decisions pretty much around the time we think we do. I mean, it would just be interesting, but if it goes the other way, that's fine with me. I don't see it as a, as a threat to free will. And uh, I'm also looking forward to things in social psychology and... Uh, uh, let's see. We're not going to have new philosophy grants, but the ones that are up and running now should result in articles and books. And I'm curious to read them mm -hmm. and see how it all goes.